Amen. I almost said you can be seated because usually we're sitting before we uh, we open God's Word together. So tonight, would you please take your Bible and turn in your Bible to Hebrews chapter eleven? Hebrews chapter eleven. I was walking down the sidewalk recently, and I was sitting there beside a sign that was advertising palm readings and uh, crystal ball, ball fortune telling. She asked me if I'd like to have my fortune told. You know, all of us want to know what the future holds for us. We want to know that the future is going to be better than our past or even our present. I guess that's why they call it fortune telling. We want to be fortunate in the future, more so than we have been. No one has more hope. No one has better hope than believer in Jesus. I mean, it's not even close. I want to focus on what I would call the big picture. You know, I realize this is risky for me to do, because at a time like this, people want a nice, you know, several steps to overcoming the coronavirus or, or the spiritual impact of that in their life or the mental, mental or emotional impact of it. I want to do something different. I'm a big picture person. I want to look at something much bigger than how to get us through, through this little slump, if I could call it that, that, that we're in. The world is only worried about the present, about this present life. But did you know that the believer, of course you know, the believer, when we talk about fortune, we're not just talking about this present life or the few years ahead of us. We're talking about forever. Hebrews 11 is called the faith chapter. There can be no faith if there is not something better for a person to do. All tribulation, all affliction, all pain and suffering is meant to point you and to put you in hope for something better that is ahead for you forever. And so I turn you to Hebrews chapter 11. Because I believe that the cure, for, the cure for anxiety and worry and panic that we may be facing or will face is the hope of a better future in, in specifically two areas that in this section of Hebrews 11 I want you to turn to tonight, either implied or it is specifically mentioned. And I'll share those two areas with you in just a moment. Let's pause briefly for, for prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we look to you. We, we pray that you might use this message tonight to accomplish in us exactly what you desire to. We pray that you would turn our eyes off of this life and turn our eyes on that life which is to come. I pray, Lord, that we would not be all caught up in our own things, and uh, in the things of this life, so that we forget what uh, is ahead, so that we forget the life that is laid up for us in glory. Lord, we pray that uh, you would ju just focus our attention on the moments that we have together now, and that people would, uh, would come away from time in Hebrews 11 in your word with a great challenge and with an encouraged heart, and, and uh, even looking forward to what lies ahead. We, we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. So we're going to be looking much ahead than just what the rest of the year might bring us. We're going to be looking ahead much farther ahead than what, what this life will bring us. We're looking at the life here, hereafter. And so there are two things in this passage that I want to point out to you. That is what every person really wants, and it's promised to the believer. And the first thing, and I hope you don't laugh at this, 
but everyone wants a better body. <laughs> everyone wants a better body. I mean, that's why so many people have member gym, right? But I'm not talking about that. We, in this time, a lot of people are just caught up in fear of disease or dying with our body. I want to turn your attention in this passage of Hebrews 11, beginning in verse 8. And I just want to to read uh, down, if you will, with me uh, to verse 10, I believe it is. It says, By faith Abraham... When he was called to go out into a place which he should, after receive for inheritance, he obeyed, and he went out not knowing whither he went. And drop down with me, please, to uh, verse 11. Through faith, faith also, Sarah herself restrained to conceive seed, and was delivered of a child when she was past age, because she judged him faithful who had promised. Therefore sprang there even of one, and him as good as dead, as many as the stars of the sky in multitude, and as the sand which is by the seashore enumerate. From an old woman's body, from an old woman's barren womb, you might say, and an old man, as good as dead, his body, that is, issued an innumerable number of people for verses 11 and 12. I share that with you because I want you to understand that this isn't something that is really difficult for the Creator. The Creator can cure, and the Creator can also train your body. In fact, that's exactly what He did here, but that is what he is going to do for every single person that knows Jesus as their Savior. We're going to have a better body one day. A better body in, in so many ways. In fact, our bodies in the future, those bodies that will be raised, are be the picture of perfection. Our bodies will be perfect. They will, will, all that you and I have ever experienced up to this point is, uh, of course, weakness and disease. We're just the remnants of God's original creation of Adam and Eve. But God is going to transform all of that. We don't have the time to read the uh, whole 15th chapter of the book of uh, uh, 1 Corinthians, but just a few verses that I want to point out from the 15th chapter, the resurrection chapter. He's talking about our body that is going to be raised from the dead. And he says, it is sown in corruption, it's in corruption. It's sown in dishonor, it's raised in glory. It's sown in weakness, it's raised in power. It's, it's sown a natural body, it's raised a spiritual body. In other words, there is coming a day when you're going to have a better body. Uh, it's going to be a body of perfection. It's going to be a body that is full, that is completely developed, that uh, has perfect senses, that uh, a body that, notice, is, is spiritual, but don't mistake that. It still is a physical body. In fact, I'm not, not sure about this, but it may be a physical body that has uh, that has metaphysical abilities, such as just exhibited when he was able to simply appear in a room without the door being unlocked. So it, it's a heavenly body, a spiritual body it's called, but de- definitely a physical body as well. It's an imperishable, imperishable body. It's an immortal body, this better body that we're promised. It's going to be a body that's whole. It's going, to, it's going to be a body that is sound, that is strong, a, a, a body of perfection. It, that uh, there will be the absence of pain in this body. You'll never have a a, 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 a single uh, pain that ever touches it. It'll be a body that will never get sick. It'll be a body that won't be 
in any way in, in danger of any kind of a virus. It'll be a body that uh, will not suffer. It'll be a body that won't age. It will be a, a glorious body. One of the greatest things is it will be a body that will never sin. We will be a person in a body that will never, ever sin. That's a better body, wouldn't you say? And because that body is a sinless body, everything else that I've already said will be the description of it. So I'm looking forward to a better body. Right now, we're concerned about our bodies. In fact, we're distancing our bodies from one another because of this coronavirus. We don't have to, have to do that. I'm looking for a better body, a body that reaches your perfection. And you know what else? It's going to be a body, not only perfection, but it's going to be a body that uh, will, be, will be one of recognition. By that, I mean you won't lose your identity. In this resurrection body, you you will be you. You will be you. You'll be distinct. You'll be your your distinction. Your kiss will survive in this resurrection body. I think you'll have the same name. Your name is written in the Lamb's Book of Life. I think you'll have the same same name. You'll have the same identity. You'll you'll have the same history. You'll have the same memory. You'll have a body, however, like Christ. That's what Philippians chapter 3 says, and verse 21, that he will give us a resurrection body that, that is like his glorious body. So we'll have a body like Christ. And when you look at Christ's resurrection the scripture, you realize, wait a minute, uh, they could identify him. There was only, uh, only one time when he was not, not identified, and that was when he held them from being able to recognize him. He was identifiable. He was, uh, his, uh, uh, his identity had continuity. There was a one-to-one contents -one in his previous earthly body, in his resurrection body. For example, he said, you destroy this temple, and in three days I'll raise, I'll raise it up again. Same body, right? Only resurrected. He was talk talking about the restoring of his body. It was a physical body. Uh, it was able to be touched, remember? He said, my body, if you don't think it's me, I'm not a ghost, touch me. Uh, he says, a spirit of ghost doesn't have flesh and bones, touch me. He sat down, he ate with them, and so it's a body that is recognized. He appears in that upper room, and uh, Thomas is there, and he says, go ahead. Put your, your hand in my wound and touch my scars. Make sure, examine, see, it's, it's me. And I'm looking for a better body. A better body that uh, is the picture of perfection. It has recognition. It, it's identifiable. All of that. But here's the second thing that I want to share with you in this, in this message that I'm calling a better future. And that is this. Not only will we have a better body, but we'll have a better life. Go back with me here to uh, the 11th chapter of Hebrews. There are two areas that really add up to a better life. Number, number one, what I call location. Where am I going to live? Number two, occupation. What am I going to do? Those, those two things are a big part of quality of life. A better life has to answer those two questions. In this 11th chapter, we see those questions answered. You know, you know that's very important to us. That's why there is a magazine for women called Better Homes and Gardens. They want a better life. That's what HGTV is all about. Better living, a better life. Of course, it's all geared to this life. But I want to take that light years ahead. I want to talk about a better life, not only in this life, but in that which is to come. Again, in verse 8 of Hebrews chapter 11, By faith Abraham, when he was called to go out, 
into a place which he should after receive for inheritance he obeyed, not knowing whether he went. Verse 9, by faith he sojourned of promise in a strange country, a foreign country, dwelling in tents with Isaac and Jacob, the heirs with him of the same promise. Why did he do that? Well, God promised him an inheritance in that physical land of Canaan. But look at verse 10. He looked for a city which had foundations whose builder and maker is God. That is not a city in the land of Canaan. You agree with me on that? Look, uh, if you will, with me in verse 13. These all died, not having received the promises, but having seen them afar off, and were persuaded of them, and embraced them, and confessed about them themselves that they were strangers and pilgrims on earth. Verse 14. For they that say such things declare plainly that they seek a country. Oh, it must have been Canaan, right? No. Read on. Read on. And truly, if they had been mindful of that country from, from whence they came out, they might have had opportunity to have returned. But now, look at verse 16, they desire a better, that is, an heavenly. Wherefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he hath prepared for, for them a city. You want a better life, along with a better body? Well, this better, better life requires a better body because the better life is located in a country, in a city that is on this planet, that is not in this present world. It is a country, a home, homeland, and the U.S. is a great country. I'm happy to be a citizen of the USA. And uh, there are people that are proud to be the citizen of, of some other country. But no matter what that country is, is, none can compare to that new earth, which is going to be our homeland some someday, according to Revelation chapter 21, the first three verses. I like city. And other people like other cities in this world, but no city in this world can come close to com comparing to that better living that we're going to have and have in a location called here a city that John the New Jerusalem, a heavenly city. Isn't it interesting that God, he is promising Abraham an earthly uh an earthly country, an earth, earthly city, cities, and yet that's not where his emphasis is. That's not what his focus is on. Even though God literally said, I'm going to give you a literal country on this earth, he's looking for a heavenly country. He's looking for a heavenly city. Don't you see that that's what gives you hope? In, in a world that often falls apart and dreams get shattered, and things happen that uh, we have not uh, prepared ourselves for and that bring us sorrow. I want you to do something. Don't think I'm weird, but I want you to just close your eyes right now, okay? Close your eyes and imagine this earth in its original condition. Imagine this earth before Adam and Eve, Eve sinned. All right? Envision the most beautiful place that you can. A place of natural beauty, complete with stately trees and a flower and majestic mountains and breathtaking waterfalls and, and gorgeous flowers and happy, happy animals and smiling people. That's just a quick glimpse in your imagined heaven. All right, you can wake up. <laughs> Open your eyes. That's what is, is the new earth and the new Jerusalem going to look, look like? Well, as I read Revelation chapter 21 and chapter 2, I find it's going to be a beautiful paradise like the Garden of Eden was originally. 
I find that it's going to be a place where God dwells with us on this new earth. That's going to be, going to be better living, don't you think? It's going to be a time on this earth when he restores it in which we dwell with God face to face. There'll be no more curse. You, you won't ever have to worry about the virus. There'll be no more diseases. There'll be no more sorrow. There'll be no more pain. There'll be no more tears. Better living requires where we're going to live, our local location. But it also has to answer the question, what are we going to do? What's our occupation going to be? Well, I'm telling you, when your body is resurrected, when you're in that better body, you're going to have a renewed, renewed mind, and you're going to have a resurrection body that is going to be full of energy and vision, and the work that gives you to do on the new earth, is you're going to be suited for that. You're going to have a special aptitude for that. You're going to have special power to do that. Did you know that if you're a believer, you're going to serve God by running the universe with him? Reign with him. You're going to reign with Christ. You're going to exercise leadership and authority, and you're going to make, make important decisions. I was just reading this morning in Luke 19, the parable of the talents and how God gave to one ten talents of money, another five, another one. And it was the multiplying of those talents, that is, that is the use, the investment and the use of, of that, that which the master gave them that caused them to have then greater responsibility, greater rule, greater authority. And so one day we're going to have that opportunity. We're going to serve God in heaven. Heaven is not going, not going to be a boring place. This living better is going to be a time in which we'll be serving the Lord, but the service that we do for the Lord is going to be fulfilling. It's not going to be a drudgery. It's going to be, we're going to have a given responsibility, and along with that, all the ability that we need to do it is going to come from God. We're not going to serve him in frustration or in fruitlessness. We're going to accomplish what God wants us to accomplish and is testing results, and we have un, we'll have unlimited resources to draw from. The best work day that you've ever, ever had in your life is just a foretaste of the joy that we will have doing what God want, wants us to do in that place that we call heaven. So, I want I to learn to think more about a better future that is ahead that is not just the 70 or 80 years that we have on this planet but the forever life that we have, have with the Lord, if you're a believer. And I think if you will focus on that, if you will focus on that better living, that better body, I think that uh, you'll be encouraged and you'll be able to success, successfully navigate through, through any difficulty that you might be facing, this one or any other one. I remember reading of the director of a medical, medical clinic that was told uh, of a terminal ill young man who came weekly for his treatment. And on one particular occasion, he came for his treatment, and there was a new young doctor that was, uh, uh, that was there. And when the doctor was talking with this young man, he just casually and casually said to him, you know, don't you, that you probably won't live out this year. Well, as the young man left, he, he stopped at the director's desk, and he was crying, and he said, that, that doctor, he took my hope away from me. And the director, quick thinking, said to the young man, well, maybe it's time for you to have a new one, a new hope. Is there a, a, a hope when our hope is taken away, away from us? There is. There is hope when the situation's hopeless. And that hope is the Lord. And that hope is in what God says. That hope is found in a personal relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. 
That hope is a better hope. That hope is the hope of a resurrection glorified body and a life eternally in heaven in the new Jerusalem on the new earth. That hope is what we are to be upon and not the problem of the day. While we look not at the things which are seen, but the things which are unseen. For the th th things which are seen are temporal, but the things which are unseen are eternal. Let's look to that. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for a better future that every believer in Jesus can look for now. We get so focused on the problems and the hype that we hear over and over so many times a, a day. And yet, Lord, we lose sight of a better future, of a better body that won't be subject to any threat of disease or sickness or death. And we're living in a better place, doing what pleases you and what will bring us the greatest joy. Thank you for that. And I pray, pray that this would be a challenge and encouragement to all of us, that we would spend our time discovering what is laid up for us, what awaits us, and that we would live the little short time that we have here preparing for that, laying up treasure in heaven, laying up treasure above, and concentrating on the eternal. We pray it in Jesus' name. We're going to have Brother Dave come, and he is going to lead us in a closing song, and then he will close us in, us in prayer. And I just want to say that after we close in prayer, why don't you, as a, a family or a group, or if you're by yourself, take a moment and pray for these two items that I mentioned earlier. Pray for Evangelist Tom Farrell, who's having brain surgery tomorrow morning, and also pray for our sister Michelle's uh, sister, who is on, on life support, Mona, and, and that it would result in her family coming to Christ, and then any other requests that you, you are aware of. And pray that God would use this uh, virus to wake up people to their need of God, and that God would protect this congregation.